we're ready to commence. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this uh, public meeting of the Northern Beaches Local Planning Panel on the 6th of December 2023. My name is Peter Bisco and I'm the chair of the panel. Uh, with me today are uh, Deborah Laidlaw and Robert Hussey, who are both expert members of the panel, and Frank Bush, the community uh, representative. Um, all members of the panel have signed declarations of interest, indicating that they have uh, no conflict of interest in relation to any of the matters uh, on the agenda for the public meeting nor the non public meeting uh, items today. Um, uh, the panel acknowledges the traditional custodians of the lands in which it gathers and pays respects to the past and present. Uh, the minutes of the previous meeting of the panel held on the 22nd of November 2023, I note, were adopted by the chair and have been posted on council's website. There are four uh, items on the agenda for the public meeting today. I will identify them uh, now and uh, then identify the non-public meeting uh, items. Uh, before I do so, I would mention that um, uh, the public meeting is an opportunity uh, for those who are registered to speak, to make oral submissions. Speakers should um, be informed that uh, the panel has been briefed their written submissions, all written submissions, so there's no need to read them again. Uh, nor is there any need to repeat what a, a previous speaker has said beyond indicating uh, that you agree with the particular points that they may, may have made. Speakers normally have three uh, minutes in which to uh, speak, but that can be extended uh, by myself as the chair uh, if you make an application uh, to me to do so. At the end of your three minutes, uh, there will be a noise which you will hear which will indicate that the three minutes um, uh, is up. As regards the uh, public uh, meeting items, uh, the first of those is identified as 4.1 on the agenda, DA 2023 stroke 0367, relating to 52 Old Baron Joey Road, Avalon Beach for demolition works and construction of shop top housing. Item 4.2 is DA 2022 stroke 1985, concerning 27 Wayne Street, Freshwater, for demolition works and construction of shop top, uh, sorry, uh, for demolition works and construction of a residential flat building. Item 4.3 is DA 2022-2152, stroke relating to 122, 122A, 124, 126, 128 Crescent Road, and 55 and 57 The Avenue, Newport, the demolition works and subdivision of land into eight lots, including tree removal and infrastructure work. Item 4.4, 4, uh, which is the final public meeting item, is DA 2022 stroke 2256 relating to 22 Raglan Street, Manly, for demolition works and construction for mixed use development with basement car parking. Uh, for completeness, I'll identify the non public uh, meeting items. The procedure of the panel is that at the conclusion of the public meeting items, that uh, public meeting will be closed and the panel will shortly thereafter retire into a closed session to consider the public meeting items and the non-public meeting items. So I'll now identify those public, non-public meeting items, which are three in number. Item 5.1, DA 2023-0798, stroke relates to 41, the Corso Manly. Uh, that is for use of premises as a tobacconist and associated alterations. Item 5.2 on the agenda is DA 2023 stroke 1011 concerning um, 38 or oh, one stroke 38 and two stroke 38 White Street, Balgala for um, the uh, Torrent subdivision of one lot into two. And Item 5.3, DA 2023-1097, stroke concerns 91 Richards Road, Scotland Island, for alterations and additions to a dwelling house. We'll now proceed to uh, deal with the first public meeting item. That's the one I identified earlier, 4.1, DA 2023-0367, stroke concerning 52 Old Barrenjoey Road abolition 
at Avalon Beach for demolition works and construction of shop top housing. There are three uh, speakers registered to speak. Uh, two, uh, 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 actually, there's only two registered to speak. One objector and a um, uh, one person on behalf of the applicant. The objector is uh, Feb Ryan Ryan Mayappen, owner of Avalon Beach House Preschool at 50 Old Baron Joey Road, Avalon. And the registered speaker for the applicant is Greg Boston of Boston by uh, Fleming. Mr. May Appen, would you like to address the panel? Thank you, Peter. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, good afternoon, panel. Uh, look, I am so I am here with Arti, who is also the owner of Avalon Beach House Preschool. We purchased uh, the business recently, and we took over on the 20th of November. We found out about the the new construction, the demolition construction at uh, the, the neighboring site, which is 52. Uh, the proximity of the site is, is really close. I know the council and the panel knows pretty much how close uh, the building is. The major concern from um, all of the families that I'm representing here is around the the light, the access to light, as well as, you know, uh, the debris and uh, the noise that it's going to produce at the time of construction. I would like to take this opportunity to explain that some of the construction uh, material could be hazardous to the children. We've got 45 families registered, 45 young children in the center between the ages of 18 months and six years. Uh, I am genuinely concerned about some of the debris, particularly from cutting concrete or removing concrete from the site. Uh, I have also done some research around the air quality issue that it can produce in terms of the microns not being uh, the right level for the children. Uh, also, the noise levels that a jackhammer could produce is quite high, more than twice than what the audible range for the children could be. So if a demolition work is happening during the time of operations, it could be really dangerous for the children. I want to make sure um, everybody is aware of it. Uh, New South Wales uh, pollution law also has identified the level of noise that's allowed during the daytime. Uh, after construction, uh, what I'm worried, what all of us uh, in the community are worried about is the height of the building. Uh, the the height of the building and the space where the level the level two is going to be constructed is right next to the playground for us. On the right side of the playground, we've already got the Red Cross building that's two stories up, which is blocking light. And if we now have this block on the left, that's going to have two stories up with a sit out in there, because the plan actually identifies a sit out. That also is going to block some of the light for us. And uh, we would be depriving the children of the opportunity to be around sun and sunlight and play. So the Department of Education, following what the, the laws from the Department of Education are, we are supposed to provide certain level of sunlight at certain point in time for the children to, to thrive and grow. Um, in this community. So those are the key points I wanted to bring up. Miss anything? No, that's the general sentiment of all families, and they've also raised their concerns. And uh, we, in particular, we we have the responsibility to look after the children, uh, their safety, and to provide a safe and sound environment. So we object that development because we are very concerned. Yep. Okay. So. Uh, the, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, just for identification purposes, uh, that was your wife, Mr. Mayapan. This it? is my wife, Arti, and she's also the owner of the Avalon Beach House Preschool. Right, thank you very much. Uh, does the panel have any questions? No. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Boston, would you like to address the panel? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, I've got a little bit of ground to cover, but I'll, I'll try and do it quickly. Uh, we're obviously disappointed with the recommendation for refusal. We engaged in pre-DA discussions uh, with Council, uh, then had further discussions with, uh, with Council's DSAP panel uh, once the application was lodged, and we were invited to make amendments, which we did um, in the form of uh, quite a comprehensive supplementary uh, submission, which is before you today. Just touching on the reasons for refusal uh, quickly, um, in relation to reason one, it's, it's uh, 
the fact that the clause 4.6 variation request for building heights been found to be not well founded. Reason two provides better particulars uh, in relation to uh, why council has formed that, that opinion. And um, what I ask you to do is to um, carefully consider the clause 4.6 variation request prepared by the proponent or prepared by me, um, rather than relying on the commentary within the council assessment report. And to that extent, if you go to page 29 of the, uh, the assessment report, you'll see comments such as um, the applicant's written request argues in part, and then there's bullet points in italics. Um, they are not my words. That is um, council's um, position in relation to their interpretation. Um, and again, in relation to the concluding comments in the report, uh, there's a comment there that um, the clause 4.6 variation request um, effectively uh, seeks justification on the basis that the control has been abandoned, which is certainly not any um, part of the clause 4.6 variation request um, prepared by the proponent. Um, we say that when you go to um, the clause 4.6 variation request prepared, in particular page six, where you're looking at the objectives of the standard, that it first talks about consistency with the desired future character of the locality. And I'd point the panel um, to the fact that uh, there's been recently approved and constructed uh, development at 62 and 66 Old Barangay Road, same side of the street directly to the north, which have been approved as three-storey elements. In fact, the more recent one in 2021 was approved by the court and uh, that also had a clause 4.6 variation request. So in terms of um, that particular development being three storeys, being found to be consistent with the desired future character and the, and the objectives of the standard, we say that our proposal um, is entirely consistent with that. The second objective um, asks you to um, consider compatibility in relation to the existing built form in the street. And again, um, from pages seven through to nine in the statement, clearly identify that a majority of the older buildings on the uh, on the western side of uh, Old Barangay Road approved pursuant to the current DCP, which turns 20 next year, um, certainly reflects the older type of development uh, in the in the area, uh, uh, which is referenced in the desired future character statement. So we say that the three-storey form in itself um, is uh, consistent with the desired future character statement and also um, consistent with the established um, character of the area. Um, in relation to the third uh, reason for refusal, it goes to stormwater. Uh, we were never uh, given an opportunity to respond to that particular issue. I say it's a matter of detailing, able to be dealt with by way of a deferred commencement condition. Um, reason for solar access, which has been touched on by the neighbour to the south. Um, the relevant objective of the height standard is to minimise solar access. The assessment report, um, in the absence of any particular standard relating to childcare centres or, in fact, overshadowing of commercial premises, has adopted the 80 square, square metre requirement that applies to dwelling houses. We say in the context of a, uh, a childcare facility constructed in a relatively high density local centre, that that's simply the wrong test. And the, the correct test is to go to the provision which talks about minimising. And um, if you refer, if you turn to the shadow diagrams prepared in support of the application, um, you'll note that, and in my supplementary statement, that the non-compliant portion of the development simply doesn't cast shadow um, onto uh, the adjoining play spaces between 9 and 12. And where there is some shadowing between uh, between 12 and 3, a majority of it is uh, within the self-shadowing alignment. Um, we've also provided shadowing for the equinox in September, which shows that there's no additional shadowing um, from the non-compliant uh, elements at that particular time. I also asked the panel just to go to DA09 in the plan bundle, which is the section. And what this section shows is that um, uh, towards the eastern end of the or Edmund Hock Avenue component of the development, that the building is well under the height standard. 
And that's been a deliberate um, design outcome to minimise the shadowing impact onto that adjoining play space. And to that extent, we say that we are consistent with that particular objective, particularly in circumstances where the building height breaching elements don't contribute, it, uh, contribute to it. Reason five storage can be conditioned. The awning reduction at the front of the site could be conditioned, which is reasons five and six. Reason seven front building line. Um, I refer to you to page 17 um, of the uh, assessment report, which contains uh, the design and sustainability advisory panel um, commentary in relation to setbacks. In their opinion, the lower two floors or the first two floors should maintain the existing nil, nil setback to Old Baron J Road established by the adjoining properties and that the upper level should be set back at least three metres. Now, um, the upper level of the proposal is now back 12 metres from the Old, old Baron J Road frontage to the building facade and 15 metres back from Edmund Hock Avenue. Uh, to the uh, to the east facing building facade so that the upper level is a recessive element in the streetscape and to that extent uh, we believe that the front setbacks proposed or the setbacks generally uh, are uh, entirely appropriate. Um, reason eight which is materiality page 19 of the assessment report again um, DSAP talk about materiality under facade treatment and so that the building will be part of a collective of buildings. It is not necessary or desirable for the building to have a strong architectural expression in form of informal materials. It should only be fit in inconspicuously. So the materiality was endorsed by DSAP and we say that that should not be a reason for refusal. Um, the reason nine or the final reason was the rear setback and shadowing impacts uh, to the adjoining property. Uh, for the reasons previously outlined, I say that that is not determinative to the application in circumstances where that upper level is set back, as I said, approximately 15 metres from the Edmund Hock Avenue frontage, and that shadowing has been minimised through the adoption of that particular building topology. The proposal is for one uh, dwelling above shops um, in a commercial centre, and we say that um, based on previous approvals recently, um, in this precinct um, and the detail of the clause 4.6 variation request as submitted um, that the panel could form an alternate view and endorse uh, the uh, endorse a recommendation for approval um, subject to a number of conditions as uh, as outlined. Apart from that panel, um, I'm in your hands, I'm happy to answer any questions. We've also got Luke Travato here who is the project architect. Um, should you have any architectural questions that uh, you would like answered. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Boston. Does the panel have any questions? Could I just ask, you referred to the LEC decision. What property was that for? Yeah, that was 62 Old Baron Joey Road. Um, it is... Uh, is an is extra... it Bucocino? No. I don't believe so. There's uh, page seven of the clause 4.6 variation request uh, sort of provides details in terms of the DA number um, for that and also an extract of the section just to give you an idea of what's been approved. Page, what, what page is that in the agenda, sorry? Sorry, it's... Uh, oh, I've got it, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's the, uh, the clause 4.6. So, that, so if you if you go to the, the street, that's the shop. The shop that's up. I think it's called Bucocino. Uh, potentially. To the north of the site, next to our J Hooker. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? No. No, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boston, for your assistance. Am I allowed to ask a question or is it just a panel? I, no, that's not the way we work. Thanks. Um, then the panel will now move on to um, the next um, item on the agenda, uh, which is item uh, 4.2 uh, relating uh, to uh, 27 Main Street, Freshwaters DA 2022 stroke 1985. Demolition works and construction of a residential flat building. 
Um, in relation to uh, that matter, we have three objectors registered to speak and three speakers registered to speak for the applicant. Uh, the objectors are Edwina and Anne uh, of Unit 4, 25 Wayne Street, Manly, Anne Sharp of 77 Brighton Street, Kirkville, Julie Reed of 56 Wayne Street, Manly. And for the applicant, we have Ben Dalgleish, uh, described as the applicant owner, um, Greg Boston of Boston Blythe uh, Fleming, and Alain Assoum uh, of Fuse Architects. Uh, Ms Anand, would you like to address the panel? Hello. Um, did he send me? Sorry, I missed that. Would you like to address the panel, uh, Ms yeah, Anand? Yes, sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you all today on behalf of myself and my neighbours in Unit 25 Wayne Street. We're actually in Freshwater, not Manly. As concerned residents, we'd like to discuss as well as shed light on some significant issues surrounding the recent decisions made by Council regarding the developer's application. I will, however, start by saying I'm extremely happy that the Council has advised to reject it because this is a unique site in its constraints and I believe should never have been zoned for medium density. A four-storey building on a small-scale block situated on a hairpin bend where parking is already beyond maximum is a huge red flag in itself. While we acknowledge and respect the Council's commitment to maintaining the size and scale of developments, we are troubled by the selective focus on certain aspects of the application and feel they have overlooked other crucial considerations. The Council the raised concern about the building's overlook on the southern side of the block stating detracts from southerly outlook. However, what perplexes us is the apparent oversight in addressing the overlook and overshadowing into our unit block directly next door. We're on the eastern side of the block facing west. It is our unit block that will suffer all major impacts. We can't help but wonder if our, our issues have been overlooked. It is a complete disregard for the loss of privacy and sunlight faced by residents on the western side of the development and is deeply troubling. Privacy is a fundamental right that should not be sacrificed in the pursuit of development. We feel we deserve proper consideration in regards to privacy, sunlight, aspect and views. The removal of each one of these factors adds to a large decline in quality of life. Living in our units for differing lengths of time, myself 20 years, we are all very aware of the seasonal movements of the sun in and around our units. So we were really struck by the number of inaccuracies, confusions and mistruths in regards to the shadowing and patterning of the sun at different times of the day slash year in the diagrams and notes that we found when viewing the solar access provisions SEPP 65 within the report. There is no question that a, a, that a more than substantial substantial amount of overshadowing will occur to our blocks and bird trade in the report, crucially affecting us residents facing the West. I'm wondering how these reports can be assumed to be accurate and considered as fact. Are they commissioned by the developer? Equally concerning is the approval of areas within the developer's application that pose significant safety risks, the dangers associated with building, parking and exiting a driveway on a hairpin bend cannot be under, understated. It is essential for the council to provide the community with a clear and detailed explanation of how these safety concerns were evaluated and mitigated. The oversights of these affected residents must be thoroughly reconsidered and addressed. Moving forward, I'd like to urge the council to consider the broader implications of the decision, taking a balanced approach to assess all the vital issues that affect the community living here in Wayne Street. The community places its trust in the council to make decisions that uphold our shared values and maintain the integrity of our neighbourhood. So thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, uh, Ms Anand. Uh, does the panel have any questions? So, Can I ask one question? If the yeah. building was reduced to three storeys high, how would you see that impacting on your amenity with um, shadowing and overlooking aspects? Um, it would still do both of those because it's actually very, very close and the, and the scale of the building, they weren't allowing for the normal, um, the council regulation setbacks either from their borders. So um, I'm a, 
we're very close to it. There's only like a couple of metres from the actual um, where the property starts at. And I'm on the bottom floor and three of my windows face west over this outlook and all three of them will just look straight onto windows looking into me and right there. And same with the person above me and the person above me because we are only a three-storey block. There's, not, um, there's no one above that. And we already have... Um, not much sunlight at certain times of the year. And looking at the um, sun charts, the, it just wasn't real because the, we're got, at the most we'll have one or two hours of sunlight in summer and that's about it on our verandas. And we all dry our clothes on there because we don't like to use dry okay. because of environmental reasons. So we all accept that we hang our clothes out on our verandas. So, yeah. Thank you. Does the panel have any other questions? Right. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Anand, for your assistance. I move on now to the second objector who registered to speak, who is uh, Anne Sharp of 77 Brighton Street, Curl Curl. Uh, Ms. Sharp, would you like to address the panel? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm not sure if my camera is working all right, but anyway. <laughs> um, yes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I support the council recommendation for refusal. Uh, the, pro the proposal is an overdevelopment of the site, which has significant constraints that necessarily restrict development. Uh, the site constraints include the size of the site, the boundary setbacks, the impact on adjoining land and the context, which includes no parking on the bend. Um, in terms of the footprint for this development, the site has a total site area of a 550, just over 550 square metres, and the development control plan requires 50% open space. So that restricts the development footprint to just over 270 square metres. Um, the building, the footprint of the proposed development greatly exceeds the, this area that is permitted for development on the lot. Uh, in relation to uh, side boundary setbacks, that's the B5, under the um, Ringer um, Development Control Plan. Um, that it, there's several non-compliance with that control uh, for the basement, the ground building, the retaining wall, and the first to, floor, first to third floor build, uh, sections of the building. Um, however, uh, the B5 appears to have been inadvertently omitted in the compliance assessment table and also the detailed assessment the side envelope is included, but not the side boundary setbacks. The, um, the non-compliance for this for the B5 is significant and really should be included in the recommendation for the refusal, uh, which is, yes, um, the number of which I don't have at hand, but it's uh, so included together with the, um, the B3 and the B7. Um, a further concern it's the earthworks and the sloping land, uh, the ex extent of the excavation, the, the zero setback for the excavation and this extent of the excavation will, in my view, affect adjoining land. It's likely to impact on the existing drainage patterns and the subsurface flow, which in turn is likely to affect soils and vegetation, including the uh, council verge. Um, so, but this matter, uh, together with potential drawdown on the adjoining land is not uh, considered, even though the matter may be relevant to the local environment, environment plan. Um, the, the proposed excavation across the site does, doesn't allow su sufficient soil depth to support trees of a reasonable height to screen the building. Um, a further concern is the access driveway. The um, the traffic, um, the traffic engineer referral response states the driveway is located, or the proposed driveway is located at the southeast corner, which is not the safest option with access being preferred from the northeast corner, which is the existing access. The report does not adequately consider the public safety and potential speed of travel for vehicles and cyclists on the downhill slope and also the risk to pedestrians. The potential hazard this poses for public safety 
will not be adequately addressed with conditions or minor amendments. I understand that Council, as the Roads Authority, will always consider the public interest and safety when assessing any application. I, I'm not sure, but if Council ideally should have the discretion to refuse a proposed driveway access on the grounds of public safety. This should always take priority and not be compromised as a concession to proposed development. And that includes in this instance. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sharp. Uh, does the panel have any questions of Ms. Sharp? No. Well, thank you. Then we'll move on to the third uh, objectives <laughs> registered to speak. And that is uh, Julie Reed of 56 Wayne Street, uh, Freshwater. Uh, Ms. Reed, would you like to address the panel? Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here to represent the concerns of the residents in our street. I commend the council planet, panel, in particular Greg Boston, for its decision to reject the current proposal that threatens the ambience and safety of Wayne Street residents. As you have already stated, the proposal is not considered, and I quote, fit with the landscape character of the area because of its deficient landscape scheme. This is a serious concern for us, as I have already spoken about in previous letters. We have over 340 residents already in this street. The proposed development only has one entrance or exit, and as Anne Sharp has already said, that will cross double yellow lines on a bend where all traffic has to negotiate to exit our street. Aside from the danger of this proposal, it is a structure that doesn't fit with the character of homes in our street. Wayne Street is the oldest and first built street in the North Manly area. Most residents were built in the 60s and few are over, a few are over 100 years old. When we first moved here almost 40 years ago, the street was a two-way traffic thoroughfare. In 1987, because of the danger, we banded together as homeowners and with the support of Dr. Peter MacDonald, our MP at the time, we successfully had the street closed for safety reasons. The top end was transformed into a cul-de-sac cul sorry, and green open space for recreation. We should preserve this heritage feature for the needs of our community. When addressing the concerns of traffic in the report, all the residents, the panel noted in paragraph two, page 138, 130, that traffic concerns were not seen as unreasonable, I quote. So we can only assume that you are aware of the issues we have submitted of, the, of those issues, but you aren't able to authorise or address them as a council. I hope Anne's right in her comment as well. Traffic and parking in a one-way street is of major concern and the bulk and size of this development and any future developments need to be addressed seriously. Our safety is everyone's priority. Cars are always illegally parked on the S bend where the double yellow lines are, always. The current overdevelopment proposal does not cater for the vehicular parking needed in a three bedroom apartment because most families have three or four cars in their homes as children grow. We did when our children gained their licenses. Thank you for listening to our objections to, to this overdevelopment and why we need to keep development in future to an absolute minimum. Perhaps if we are really serious about the safety in, it, in our already intensely developed street, we could have the zoning in this particular case changed to 1A to ensure the residents are truly looked after. Thank you. Thank you, you uh, Ms. Reid. Uh, does the panel have any questions? Could I just ask you, what do you see as the extent of the double yellow lines? in the street oh absolute major important you cannot go down that street if any car is parked on anywhere near the double yellow line you have to veer to the right and cross the road mm -hmm. so you if there was a are car they, coming, are, they, are they for the full extent of the street right around the corner to the coldest sack uh it it goes right around to the the current 
it goes the whole way around the S Bend and, the and around the whole block that is currently being developed. So if they put a driveway at the bottom end, as Anne Sharp says, it, it will propose it will it's so dangerous. So dangerous. There is a car driveway from a unit coming opposite where cars, if they were coming out, would collide. That ha that is how bad it is. It's already it is you. already chaotic. It's chaos. Does the panel have any other questions? Hmm. Okay, then if not, uh, thank you, Ms. Reid, for your assistance. Uh, we'll move on then to the registered speakers for the uh, applicant. The first one on the list is uh, Ben Dalgleish, the uh, applicant owner. Uh, Mr. Dalgleish, would you like to address the panel? Yep. Uh, hi, everyone. My name's Ben. Um, so I'm the applicant and the owner for the site. Um, a lot of the uh, the more technical aspects I'll probably leave to my planner, uh, Greg Boston, to address. Um, but I probably just wanted to give a bit of history and background to the panel, um, just about my level of disappointment with the way the process has happened. Um, you know, obviously the the site is zoned for the use that we're putting on, which is you know we're allowed to do residential site buildings. Um, we originally started this process back in January last year. So we're kind of coming up to, to two years. Uh, we had a pre-lodgement for the site and, you know, we obviously went through it with DESA and again with council, we had two pre-lodgements. Uh, at great expense, we, we, you know, we lodged plans and then we obviously amended the plans afterwards uh, due to feedback from council and DESA. And we felt we adequately uh, responded to all the queries raised by DESA and council. Um, we had, I, I guess, uh, a buy-in and, and confirmation from council on the latest scheme. Uh, and then right at the death, so kind of October, so as I said, kind of coming up to two years, uh, it was all kind of hit on the head by a, a higher up assessment manager, um, you know, without any further real opportunity to, to address it. And it was simply remove the top story. Um, and in this particular instance, removing the top story is uh, makes the development unviable. Um, and I think it was just, from my perspective, very, very disappointing to to not be given that proper process. Um, sorry, Edwina and Julie, um, you're just making cry faces on your um, screen and I can see it. Would you mind not doing that, please? Your camera is still on and I can see you. Um, so I guess, yeah, from my perspective, it was just ultra disappointing that the process was was very broken. You know, we were we went through right right the way along. We responded to landscape. We responded to traffic. We you know we read we redrew the scheme. Um, we were in a position where essentially we we had uh, confirmation from the assessment officer, confirmation from his manager, confirmation from DSAP that we'd adequately responded to their concerns on the site. Um, you know obviously it's you know it's an infill development. We understand that you know we're not always going to be. Um, particularly popular with with what we're trying to achieve but you know it's it's zoned for what we're trying to do um, and it's considered that that process and just the way it was right at the last minute and we weren't really given that opportunity in the process that from my perspective was very upsetting and disappointing thank you mr Dalgleish. does the panel have any questions no, thank you then we'll, we'll move on to the next uh, registered speaker for the applicant, who is uh, Greg Boston of Boston Clinic. Uh, Mr. Boston. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, look, that summary is about right. Uh, there was a, a final set of amended plans submitted uh, for Council's consideration. And if you turn to page 90 of the assessment report, um, which is the, the final conclusions in relation to how the plans currently before you address the DSAP um, uh, recommendations. It says here that uh, the development has been satisfactorily amended and refined to address the issues raised by DSAP and as such the proposal is acceptable in that regard. You'll read through the assessment report in relation to there being no unacceptable impacts in relation to privacy and solar access. They have been comprehensively dealt with. Um, it would appear that um, Council's fundamental concern is um, in relation to the Clause 4.6 and what precedent that might create. 
And uh, all I can say to that is that um, this is an isolated site. It is in a R3 zone. Yes, it's at the zone boundary interface, but we say that, uh, that we have appropriately dealt with that zone boundary interface. Unlike, um, so reasons one and two relate to um, uh, the 4.6 not being well founded. And again, I asked the panel to read uh, the 4.6 variation request as prepared by the uh, proponent, not as interpreted by council in the assessment report. Unlike Pitwater LEP building height standard, which we dealt with on the first item, um, the Warringah LEP building height standard doesn't talk about desired future character. Um, the first objective is to ensure that buildings are compatible with the height and scale of surrounding and nearby development. So that is, that is the test in terms of building height as it relates to compatibility. And if you turn to um, you know, pages 14 through to uh, 16 in the clause 4.6 variation request, you'll note that a majority of development uh, in this particular R3 pocket is four and five storeys in height. So in relation to overall building height, uh, we say that uh, applying project venture, which has been adopted in terms of an assessment in, uh, in relation to compatibility, that from a streetscape perspective, we present as three storeys to the adjacent R2 low density zone to the north. Um, and uh, where we present as four storeys to the south, the upper level is now being pushed back to be a recessive element in the street. And we're certainly consistent with um, the, uh, the height and uh, scale of, of medium density development. Um, I also um, draw you in relation to that zone boundary interface issue, if you go to page 85 of the assessment report, and again, these are comments from DSAP, um, which is Council's Design and Sustainability Panel. And about halfway down the, the page there, um, there's a sentence that starts, in terms of scale transition to the R2 zone, the northern building form, which is four storeys high and non-compliant is cited so that it has an effective three-storey scale when viewed from Wayne Street. So the building's been located relative to that zone boundary interface to present as a three-storey building form. And relative to the height of the street, it's compliant with the 11 metres. The non-compliance arises due to the topography of the site, notwithstanding that council's position is that topography isn't a, uh, a reasonable environmental planning ground in support of the clause 4.6 variation request. Um, we say that the 4.6 variation request is well founded and that the panel has the jurisdictional ability to uh, overturn the recommendation before them and endorse a recommendation for approval. In fact, I'm sure there's a draft report with a set of conditions for this particular development sitting in council's system somewhere. Reason three relates to SEP 65 and ADG non-compliances. 100% um, of apartments get Three, more than three hours of solar access, 100% of apartments naturally cross-ventilated. Uh, the panel will be aware of the recent um, judgment in construction development management, the City of Sydney, uh, where Commissioner Horton indicated that in terms of the ADG and SEP 65, the focus should be on the qualitative provisions, not the quantitative. And to that extent, we say that there is no adverse impact um, in relation to that building height standard in relation to overshadowing, um, privacy, um, visual bulk or streetscape. Reason for number of stories, um, again, um, we rely on the clause 4.6 variation request, the endorsement of DSAP in relation to the building form on the site um, to demonstrate that the number of stories should not be fatal to the application. Reason five, front building setback and building bulk. Again, um, endorsed by DSAP on page 85 of the, um, of the assessment report, um, they indicated that either a 6.5 metre setback or a pulling back of the upper level occur on the southern side of the development, which has been provided. And that is why uh, the assessment report indicates that we have fully adopted all of the recommendations of DSAP as it relates to ensuring an appropriate built form on this particular site. The final reason for refusal is landscaped open space. Council's provision um, is 40%. Um, what I say is that we um, 
uh, we've got 18.2% of the site as deep soil landscaping as opposed to the ADG's minimum requirement of 7%. In fact, 32% of the site is available for landscape treatments. And I note that um, on page, um, I think it is 18, anyway, in the assessment report, um, Council's landscape officer um, has actually endorsed or signed off on, it's on the bottom of page 91, um, has signed off on the updated landscape plans as providing sufficient buffer screening to boundaries, as well as amenity planting to soften the built form as viewed from the streetscape. So we say that in terms of um, the qualitative um, outcomes uh, in relation to landscaping, that we certainly overachieve in terms of the minimums of the ADG, and where deep soil opportunity is provided, Council's landscape officer has endorsed the landscape treatments proposed, not only in relation to the quantum, but in relation to being able to provide um, substantial screening um, elements to soften and screen the development in the streetscape. So to that extent, we say that um, uh, with all due respect, the reasons for refusal of the application um, uh, shouldn't be preferred over the submissions that I've made this morning. I ask the panel to carefully review the updated clause 4.6 variation request, uh, which, can, which was contained within the supplementary statement dated 11th of July, where we provided that comprehensive response to the DSAT minutes and the minutes provided and the issues uh, identified uh, by council at that time. Just very briefly on the balance of the issues raised by the neighbour, um, traffic implications have been signed off by Council's traffic engineer, solar access, uh, it's been confirmed that we maintain compliance with the ADG as it relates to shadowing to the neighbour. Privacy has been dealt with through the design and location of fenestration and if you look at the eastern elevation you'll see that where there is um, a direct um, line of sight, that it's certainly not within a nine metre radius, and the lower portions of the glazing has been obscured um, and non-operable um, to ensure that pro appropriate um, privacy relationship to the neighbours. Um, in relation to excavation, again, it has been minimised. It's been signed off by Council's engineers. There's a geotechnical report indicating its acceptability and stormwater again um, has been appropriately dealt with with the recommendation for approval by Council's stormwater engineer. Um, I'm um, very happy to answer any questions that the panel might have. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Boston. Uh, does the panel have any questions? Can I just check in terms of the, what the neighbours have said? Is there a double yellow line up the middle of Wayne Street? Otherwise, it looks like there's a single yellow line along the curb, which represents probably a, a prohib prohibition on parking along there. There is no double line that causes a problem for turning into the proposed basement. Yeah, look, that, that, that is my understanding, and the Council's technical uh, officer will no doubt be able to confirm that. But uh, my understanding is that there's no legal impediment to um, being able to swing into the uh, into the proposed basement. Thank, thank you. Uh, I just had a sort of couple of questions slash comments. Uh, Greg, the building is four storeys as it faces north and the, the whole of that top storey breaches the height standard, which suggests that the breach is not just about topography. Uh, normally, if it's topography, a, a fits under and a fits over, whereas in this case, the whole lot's over. Um, so I'm just, I guess, looking to see, you know, how you justify that fourth story or the top story. And I just, while you're at it, one further comment is on the comment you made that there was no adverse solar impact. The so-called view from the sun diagrams you've provided are not true view from the sun, they're some sort of hybrid which doesn't allow you to see which bit of the building is causing overshadowing. So as a subsequent sort of comment, can you also um, deal with whether you have run that model as a proper view from the sun um, model and can absolutely confirm that fourth story doesn't cause additional overshadowing? 
Yeah, sure. Look, the, the project architect is actually registered as well, so I might defer the shadow analysis to uh, to him, if that's okay. Um, look, in relation to the building height breach, um, if you go to, I don't know if you've got the clause 4.6 variation request in front of you, um, but there, there's a there's a building height blanket diagram in there, and um, what the 4.6 identifies is that um, the northeastern corner of the roof form, so setting aside the lift overrun, breaches the height standard by 500 millimetres or 4.5 per cent. Southwestern corner 1.3 metres or 11.8 per cent. The southeastern corner um, 1.13 metres or 10.2 per cent. The lift overrun does breach by 1.67. So to answer your question in relation to it being a whole floor plate, um, that's not correct. Um, it is, um, yes, there's habitable floor space, um, but it's certainly not a three metre you know, whole floor plate. Um, no, no, I'm saying the that the the entire floor plan. I mean, normally, as I say, the point is that, and a normal way when you use top topography as justification, it's because the land, the height plane is sloping across the building. So you'd normally have, a say, a bit that's under the height plane, a bit side. In this case, the whole of the roof is over, including the lifts. Yeah, co correct. Look, the, absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm not moving away from that. On the northern side of the building. Uh, and the, the building sits down relative to the northern sort of street frontage, um, uh, approximately a story. So um, you'll see that on the sections, and that's where DSAP were, were generally comfortable with that. Um, and on the northern end, it's sitting below the height standard. Um, so again, um, there was some give and take in terms of uh, in terms of the extent of of breach, but. Um, in terms of the broader issue of compatibility, I've already spoken to that and, and um, you know, we rely on the clause 4.6 variation request. So, that, so there's no uh, question of re, re, revisiting the full story, <laughs> story then, I think is what you're saying. Oh, look, um, we we were happy um, to have a look at um, putting like a, rather than apartments and mezzanine bedrooms up at that level. Um, but by the time that this matter was on the agenda, it was all too late to do that. Um, but as um, as my client said, for a, for a site such as this in an R3 zone, to, to lose a whole apartment just kills the scheme. And in circumstances where this is two years along, where we've been back to DSAP twice and we're given the green light to, to formally amend the application with amended plans, that's where the frustration lies. Um, but um, again, look, we, we believe that on merit, um, the application is is acceptable. But if if the panel were of the mind to allow a further amendment to reduce the amount of floor space up there, we'd certainly be prepared to look at that. It was DSAP that suggested the communal open space um, on the on the southern side? I think that that is a value add. It's a it's a good amenity outcome. Um, but uh, you know, we're in the panel's hands. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions of Mr. Boston? Can I just follow up that? If there was consideration of a reduced area on the top, how would you do that? How how, how could you achieve that? Oh, look, at the, the clients here who's actually had a look at that, but it would be it would be sort of um, masonette type um, upper level apartments where there was some bedrooms. Um, up at that upper level and um, uh, it would be a more reduced footprint so that the upper level would pull away from that northern northern interface but just trying to understand whether it's a streetscape zone boundary interface or simply a numerical provision that you're trying to reduce the amount of um, amount of, of breach but um, but look if it's a difference between um, a, uh, a negotiated approval and a refusal, uh, we'd certainly be, be happy to have a look at, uh, at an alternate that, that might satisfy the panel. Thank you. Does the panel have any further questions? Very well. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Boston, for your assistance. Uh, that leaves then uh, Alain Assoum of Fuse Architects uh, just as a registered speaker. Mr. Assume, would you like to address the panel? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think Greg and 
and our client has covered a, a fair bit of ground um, today. So I'm happy to answer any questions that the panel members might have. Very well, does the panel have any questions? Well, just following up on that view from the sun question, why you didn't run a proper view from the sun model, which would have allowed um, with, with certainty to see what the impact of that top floor was. Have you have, okay. you have you run a, a proper view from the sun model, or is it just? I, I think I, I believe we did. Do you mind if I? No, this this isn't this model? isn't a view from the sun model. This is something yeah, no, else. I, I, yeah. I understand, but do you mind if I share my screen? I can explain to you yeah. the, the diagram that we provide as part of the application. Yeah. Um, just give me one moment. I just need to change the settings for sharing. One moment, please. Thank you. Are we allowed to ask questions? No. Right. The sharing option should be available to you now. Thank you. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I'll just give you a bit of background in terms of um, how we structured the, the the studies that we did prepare in terms of the overshadowing impact on the neighbouring properties, specifically to the um, to the east. As you can see here, what we did is, is we researched and we mapped out, I suppose, the, the layouts specifically to those neighbouring apartments that you can kind of see here. So the, the, the three kind of types that were available so to understand, I suppose, from our perspective, is what type of space is behind the windows that are facing the boundary and, and the street itself and the location, the extent of the balconies um, that they receive. So that was the first step in terms of mapping out, I suppose, the existing context that we were looking at. Um, I'll go back to this. So, Again, the first step that we did is was prepare um, based on the mapping out in three dimension the topography of the site based on a survey. Um, and then using the survey as well, um, it showed the full extent of the neighboring buildings in terms of the height of the ridges, the eaves, the window locations, um, et cetera. So again, that allowed us three dimensionally to model the existing context um, as it currently stands. And that's what in plan view, what you're currently seeing on the screen there. So the, the usual kind of overshadowing diagrams pre were prepared. But in addition to that, and Deborah, I'll take your point and I'll address why we didn't use the Sun Eye View kind of diagram structure, which we have for our building itself, was can, that can we then mapped stop, out. Stop that actually, because you actually, I, I, and I apologize. Oh no, is it the same thing? Because there is a second set of diagrams which do appear to be Sun Eye View. Yeah. Is that the one with the yellow on? Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're the sign eye views for um, for the proposal itself, which shows the building itself and confirming that our CEP 65 diagrams regarding the daylight is satisfied. So that's where Greg's talked about 100% natural ventilation, 100% solar, and we talked through the design review excellence panel through those diagrams. But in terms of the reason why we did what we did in terms of um, measuring and, and identifying the impacts on the neighbouring properties was that we always want to see the windows that face the boundary itself because what we had was the, the shadow itself being modelled in elevation. So we had the plans previously that showed you, um, I suppose, the shadows in plan, what they were doing from the existing and the proposed, but it doesn't show you elevationally what the proposed shadows from our scheme were doing on the neighbouring property. And that's what the second set was regarding, is we, we, we operated the camera in a way that showed us those two critical elevations that were facing the side boundaries from the neighbouring properties. And then three-dimensionally, the um, the shadow cast from our proposal, um, you could see from each view. So you could see from there at June the 21st at 11am, the, the, the shadow cast 
from the neighboring block to itself. And as we kind of come around, and you can see it there at 1.30 p.m. So we did it for every half an hour. Why did you shift that minute? Sorry. I'm not going yeah. to now. Could, could I? As you could can I, see there. Yeah. I just wonder if I could you stop it. I mean, what, what I'm what the question was primarily about what the impact of the top floor was, and, and that seems to be shown on DA415, which is the yellow. If you scroll down, is it 415 sun view diagrams? Da, 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 da. They're in yellow. Sorry, I'm getting there. there yeah, but these ones. Now, if you, if you scroll around to uh, after 1, 1 and 2, 3 p.m., I mean, that I guess that was the crux of my problem, is that those clearly show that that top floor is causing additional shadowing. Yeah, and, and the shadow diagrams, what they did, is just to be clear, is this shows the shadow from the additional level. So this shows the shadow from the, the complete proposed envelope. And then the analysis here shows you what's being achieved currently with a DCP compliant envelope and a proposed. So it's 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 showing you currently what how much sunlight those apartments are receiving, which is the existing line, what the, a DCP compliant envelope, what it would have meant, and then what the proposal is achieving. So it's showing you in all three situations for all critical apartments for the neighboring property at 25 Wayne Street, unit three, four, seven, eight, nine, and twelve, what what is the current compliant and the proposed um, schemes have impacted, if at all, the, the solar access. OK, so thanks. Thank you. Yeah, and then can I just, while, while I'm speaking, can I just touch on, I suppose, this is the, the, the height plane diagram that we prepared. Again, taking note that we had prepared the, the height plane, well, the, the modelling of the existing context um, with topography and the neighbouring building by registered surveyors um, details provided. And as you could see, and this is a discussion that we had with the um, design review panel, but also council officers, if we're talking about the existing context, is that the new ta the, the two neighbouring properties at 25 Wayne Street exceed the height limit it themselves. So in terms of the existing context um, and, and what we're proposing is that it's no different than what the existing buildings exceed the current LEP height plane, maximum height plane, as this diagram kind of demonstrates. So you can see here 25 Wayne Street in terms of the roof eave, the roof ridge, and where that that where that is, is that you've got one level pretty much that exceeds the height limit with the neighbouring, with the one facing the north um, with the roof over the height plane. So again, this is all part of the discussions we had in terms of how the the building fits in terms of the existing character and how the the LEP height plane maximum height plane um, could be seen in terms of its existing context with the neighbouring buildings as well. That was it. Unless someone has a question for me. Right. Thank you. Uh, does the panel have any further questions? No. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, then, uh, thank you for your assistance, uh, Mr. Assume. Therefore, we have now concluded all the speakers, registered speakers for item 4.2. We'll move on now to item 4.3 on the agenda uh, concerning 122 Crescent Road, Newport, DA 2022, stroke 2152, the demolition works and subdivision of land into nine lots, including tree removal and infrastructure. Uh, works. Now, we have um, two objectors who are registered to speak and uh, two people for the applicants. The objectors are Lance Doyle of Doyle Consulting Group, speaking on behalf of Mr. Simon Cole of 120 Crescent Road, Newport, and Damien Hewan of 50 The Avenue, Newport. And for the applicant, we have uh, Stephen Googe, of Ethos Urban, planner for the application, and Marco Silver of Ethos Urban. Uh, Mr. Doyle, would you like to address the panel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I assume you can hear me? Yes, thank you. I'm representing Mr. Coles. Uh, he's the, the, the 
the adjacent property owner at number 120. The, um, there are no fundamental objections to the proposal. What we'd like the panel to uh, assure us that the foreshore building line amendments um, are, are taken into account. I note that it, one of the conditions says the building footprint on the proposed lot five, which is the one directly adjacent to my client's site, will provide a minimum setback of 15 metres to the main high water mark. I, I'm assuming that that measurement reflects the proposed changes to the foreshore building line in the LEP. So I, and I'd just like that to be shown on the approved footprint plan on page 266 of the report or of the agenda, just so it's clear to anyone including certifiers and other parties that the approved footprint has to be amended to reflect that new foreshore building line. Because as you can see from the LEP map number 10, the foreshore building line wraps around the existing development on the subject site, which is an anomaly, obviously. Uh, so we just like some clear indication on the approved building footprint plans prior to that amendment that that needs to be shown on the plan number uh, on page 266, which I think the memory is plan 903, but I'll just check. And it's reflected in the condition seven. Sorry to baffle you with numbers like that. It's page 265, actually. I know three. Yes, and what I'm saying is on the yeah on that on that plan, um, the foreshore building one. What we'd like it to clearly show is the that 15 metre setback shown on that approved plan. So there's no confusion with prospective purchasers. Uh, certifiers or whatever, just so it's clear from day dot what that uh, setback is, please. Sorry, and just that, uh, what, what what was the building footprint condition number, Jeff? Uh, the building footprint is condition 17. Oh, sorry, there's condition 119, which talks about the approved building footprint under an ADA. Yeah, 17 does say the building footprint on the proposed lot five should provide a minimum setback of 15 metres to mean high water. Does that, Correct. that, that you're that happy with that, that or you think that's not enough? I, I just think we'd be comforted by seeing it on the plan that goes out with the, the approved subdivision. Uh, so it, maybe with, if the plans... Yeah, if it was said prior, that the plat was prior to um, whatever, prior to the, the plans be amended in accordance yeah, with prior, so all that 17 has got to be done, yeah, showing yeah, on the plan. Yeah, just prior to CC would, uh, would satisfy that, just so it's clear to yeah, everyone. Okay. Yep. But apart from that, we don't have any fundamental issues with it. Um, so and we look forward to the, the rest of the DAs for the marina. But we'll leave that to another day. Uh, thank you to the panel. Thank you. Does the panel have any other questions? Uh, I just have one. I'm just on the last point, actually. Condition 17 does say the following amendments are made to the approved plan. Uh, so um, they would include the two plans which you uh, referred as the report. Yeah, um, it just seems to be. Um, a bit different in interpretation to uh, 119. It says as amended by the condition of consent. If it said as amended to require a 15 metre setback to the uh, main high watermark, that would keep me quiet. So, so sorry. So, what 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 you're seeking is that. It should not refer to 15 metres? It should refer to the mean high water mark? Or what, what is it? That no, you're I mean, no the, um, we're talking about the foreshore building line. The foreshore building, the foreshore building line. line is 15 metres from the 
mean high water mark? It should be as amended by condition 17 of this consent. Yes, that would do the trick. Yes, I agree with that. All right. Thank you. Sorry to be fussy, but we just wanted that to be clear. Yeah. All right. Th th thank you. Um, thank you. Um, uh, then the next registered um, uh, speaker who's an objector is Damien Hewan of 50 The Avenue, Newport. Mr Hewan, would you like to address the panel? Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I had Marsdens do my initial submission. I'm just summarising some key points from that. After reading the latest assessment report from Adam Croft, um, the first issue is trees. Um, the initial application didn't satisfactorily, in my opinion, deal with trees 57, 58 and 59 and to a lesser extent 56 on the site. Um, there's a subsequent landscape referral response that now recognises these trees as being significant and needing to be retained, which I'm pleased to see. Um, however, I'm still very curious to understand how the arborist um, can suggest that tree 57 will survive given the roadway, all power and uh, services essentially um, go through the near the centre of that tree. If you refer to the superseded plans, um, page eight, I don't know whether you can pull that up quickly enough, but um, the centre of the tree is essentially at the beginning of the roadway which joins the avenue. I'm not an arborist myself, but I think it's um, that tree surely cannot survive. Um, the nicest aspects of the eastern foreshore of Windy Jimmy Bay are that it's still got a lovely tree canopy when compared to the opposite side of the bay. Um, and I'd like to ensure that that's maintained with this development. There are significant trees on that side. So that's point one. Point two um, is traffic and parking. Um, Forgive me if I've not read or missed something. I've, I've only had access to Mr. Croft's response uh, 2111 uh, recently, but there is, in my original recommendation, I uh, suggested that a distributed approach to accessing the site would be favourable as opposed to all cars or vehicular access coming through the avenue. I note the plan does provide an alternate parking space option um, for the lots adjoining the Crescent Road, but it's unclear to me as a non-planning um, professional whether that's the uh, way in which the site is going to be managed or, or what Council's view is upon that. That's my first point, but I would um, highly commend Council if they are going to move towards a distributed model rather than all traffic coming through the avenue. Um, I've not seen anywhere on the amended plans that provides for additional parking for residents and residents guests, um, and I believe this should be dealt with. There are unresolved issues noticed in the latest submission from Adam Croft 2111 um, that no stopping signs and additional off street parking needs to be provided within the development site, and I've not seen that be included in any of the documentation. Again, forgive me if I've missed something. Um, the, there is a suggestion that the road will be widened, but uh, once again, I'm not privy to any planning documentation around the road widening. Um, and obviously with any road widening comes some revised stormwater treatment. Um, I'd invite the panel to visit the lower section of the avenue. The road is significantly dilapidated today and the stormwater management system was probably created in the 60s by um, some uh, resident with concrete and a bit of steel. So it's not a professional approach and it needs to be dealt with properly. Um, and I'd like to, uh, I think um, we should be seeing plans to that approach prior to any approval. Um, vehicular access, once again, um, 
the plans do not cater for garbage management, fire evac, uh, turning of vehicles over five metres that I've seen. My apologies if I've missed something. The latest waste re referral response on the 10th of October still, refer still refers to outstanding issues for trucks manoeuvring, inadequate roadway, um, and that does not meet the requirements of the DCP. Um, I think it's also very important to have defined bin locations so we don't have an amalgamation of a thousand bins on the verge of the avenue should the avenue be the only access point, notwithstanding I'm recommending against that. Um, the final point I'd like to make, which probably isn't um, uh, relevant to this DA because I understand this day is just a concept plan and providing approval for clearing, but the original plan submitted by the uh, owners of the site were to suggest that the uh, marina would extend to the north. Um, and I feel that that uh, the no marina or private um, facility should encroach on public land. And so I, I just want to reiterate that as well. There are finally, there are several houses marked for a dilapidation um, uh, report. Um, I'm not sure why uh, 48 and 50 the avenue were omitted from that given the same proximity to the site as the other two houses nominated. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. If anyone has any questions, I welcome them now. Yes, thank you, Mr. Hewan. Does the panel have any questions? No. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for that. Then we'll move on to the registered speakers for the applicant. First of all, Mr. Stephen Googe, uh, Ethos Urban Planner for the application. Uh, would you like to address? Sure. Thank, thank you, Chair and panel. Um, so uh, Stephen Gaz from Ethos Urban, uh, where the planners who um, who um, completed the application. Um, as I'm sure the panel can see, um, there's been quite a lot of work um, to and to and fro with the um, the engineering teams and the referrals, landscaping, traffic, waste, parking, with several referrals. Um, where we got to was essentially revising the scheme from nine lots to eight lots, uh, which brought it entirely in line with the building envelope controls, the minimum lot size controls, um, and, and, and any you know, planning related issues. Um, we really don't have much to add in terms of uh, you know, explanation of the proposal unless there's any specific questions of us. Um, I, I too would commend the planners for detailing it all out in terms of the, uh, the back and forward. Um, I'm happy to address both of the submissions if it assists. It might just give some clarity. I was taking notes. I'll do my best to get through them. Um, certainly, just on the first one, um, in, in relation to Mr. Um, Mr. Doyle, um, very comfortable for that proposed amendment to clarify the conditions referencing each other. Um, I think we were clear on that intent, but absolutely understand that um, that concern. Um, in relation to the items by Mr. Hewan, and f forgive me if I miss anything, um, just in relation to landscaping and trees uh, and street trees, um, the application was amended um, sort of quite late in the piece in relation to tree 57 specifically. Um, that involved the relocation of the access driveway further to the east um, from where it was originally proposed much closer to tree 57. Um, so with the, uh, the latest set of um, latest set of plans that are being sought for approval, uh, that location of the driveway is, is well away from the, the trunk and much further away than what it was originally as submitted. Um, and also has been considered in detail by Council's landscaping and our arborist in terms of the construction methodology of the driveway in that location. Uh, that was done in recognition that there may be um, quite significant vehicles turning around in that point, um, but that was, uh, I guess, a, a quite a point of discussion uh, with Council to ensure that that driveway could be relocated to ensure there was no discrepancy uh, of, of that tree. Um, in relation to um, uh, car parking, um, and access to parking. Um, it, it's quite a, um, a, an interesting proposition. Um, we had initially discussed with Council in terms of condition 17 of the consent, which relates to a requirement for vehicle access to lots, I think lots two and three to be off the private driveway rather than uh, from uh, Crescent Road. Uh, we would be open to the scenario where um, if, if it was seen that a response to the submitter to not have all vehicles coming in off the driveway, um, the shared driveway, and that some could access off Crescent Road, as is the case for the other 
uh, vehicles and we'd be happy uh, for that condition 17 to be removed if it satisfied the panel and uh, and and the submitter at the same time um, happy to clarify that if there's any any questions on the set of plans that, that were provided there were two locations shown one from crescent road and one uh, from the the shared driveway uh, and it was annotated as being a potential alternate um, so if there was a, a preference for that to be shifted we, we wouldn't have any objection to that and that would require just a minor amendment to condition 17. Um, in relation to the road widening and discussions uh, with council in one of the early referrals from uh, council's engineering and traffic team as part of the subdivision controls in the pitwater dcp there's a, a need for um, improvements to the carriageway and the adjoining roads in relation to the subdivision. Uh, we worked uh, in quite a lot of detail with our traffic engineers, architects um, and councils, traffic engineer and waste teams. So the, the proposal or the information that was provided to give clarity to allow that um, uh, that upgrade to, to occur, I'm not sure whether that has been provided to the panel. Uh, but that did a couple of things. It clarified the expansion of the carriageway, um, which would then allow on-street parking to be uh, provided on the southern side of the avenue. Um, there is not proposed to be any expansion of the ca of the carriageway, uh, if you like, much further west of the um, of the proposed access driveway down towards number fifty and down towards the water on the basis that, uh, that that's not required to service the proposal. And also there's a number of significant trees within the roadway and essentially on the on the carriageway that we didn't want to remove. And there's also some parking um, for those residents, which is within the road reserve that we, we didn't want to change that condition on. Uh, so essentially, I guess, to respond specifically to Mr. Hewan's uh, question, the upgrades to the, to the road um, allow for on-street parking and have been designed very carefully in terms of vehicle crossings and widths to allow garbage trucks uh, to come down um, the avenue to turn around using our driveway um, and to exit in a forward direction. Um, for the benefit of the panel, we had some concerns about the requirement to do that on the basis that that occurs currently in any event, but given the proposed subdivision, um, we, we understood the potential need to upgrade the roadway. In, res in relation to stormwater works, um, we wouldn't have any uh, issue in terms of the necessary upgrades that go with that. Um, it's probably just probably more of a, a comment that I imagine that will be captured as part of the separate um, approvals under the Roads Act needed to, to do that work. Um, that covers off the, the turning and vehicle um, item. It also covers off uh, waste. Uh, so I think Mr. Hewan referred to a, um, a referral in October. Um, there is a referral on the 13th of November, uh, which relates to these updated plans which clarifies the potential for turning. It clarifies the bin collection locations as required by Council's Waste uh, Consultant. Uh, if it benefits um, uh, lot one is to be collected from either Crescent Road or the Avenue, lots two, three and four from Crescent Road, five, six, seven and uh, eight uh, from um, the uh, from the avenue adjacent to the side entry. So as many as can go to, to Crescent uh, Road uh, are being done to minimise the number on uh, the avenue. Um, in relation to uh, the marina layout, um, uh, it's, it's understood in terms of the commentary, it's obviously a separate application, which we are um, in, the, in the process of sort of moving towards subject to the outcome of this application um and have had discussions with with council and also crown lands in relation to that um, and necessary landowners consent to move forward but the design is not yet uh, finalized or submitted um, and dilapidation report um i i don't I, on behalf of the applicant I, I don't disagree entirely um if there was a um an oversight um for a dilapidation report if that was a, a preference to make sure that uh, it's being applied equitably in terms of surrounding properties uh, so I'm conscious of taking any more time. I, I, I hope that covers off those items. If there are any other questions, happy to answer them. Yes, thank you, Mr. Bruce. Does the panel have any questions? Uh, I just, with, with the marina application, is it envisaged there be a, a, a reduction so that each lot got one mooring? Yes, es essentially. Uh, it would reflect very much the case of what, what occurs on the uh, similar properties sort of up and down. So yes, essentially to allow um, marina access to those residents. Okay. And with the timing of the, uh, the DA is progressing, but with the t timing of the physical works on the marina, how do you envisage that? I think there are conditions on requiring 
That's right. Um, Condition 120, I think, uh, and also I, I didn't yeah. jot down the number, but the cessation of the commercial use before should be any any associated physical works. The marine private marina has to be constructed, and the associated um, apron re removal and reconstruction before the subdivision um, that, that, certificate. And that's okay, yeah. That, that's correct. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. it was recognised that there's a couple of reasons for that, which we probably don't need to go into, both from a permissibility uh, point of view, um, but also uh, a, an operational and orderly development point of view. That it, it makes sense that the marina needs to be resolved before that subdivision yeah. can, certificate can occur. So. Uh, we recognise that's that's then on us to to, to do that, but um, we understand the need for that condition. Okay, cool. And just one thing, final thing on the on the widening of the avenue. I I, I think um, Mr. Hume raised the question at Tree Fifty Nine. I, I don't think that widening it's it, it's indicated there's a minor encroachment into the TPZ of Fifty Seven and Fifty Nine. I think by that widening, is that correct? So they're intended to stay. I uh, will just double check. Uh, correct. Yeah, 59 is the one that sits essentially next to the road reserve. So that's um, not going to be yeah, that's no. not going to be removed. It, it, perhaps if you're looking, sorry, I'm not sure the, the page reference that might be, you're in the business oh, papers. I'm looking at um, the 265. Um, the A903. Uh, yes, yep, page 265 of the, the business papers. Um, yeah. We we were conscious of how it's oh, represented yeah. represented yeah. in the plan, seeking approval uh, and and showing things outside of our boundary. But the grey hatched area, uh, if you like, represents uh, if you the extent of the proposed road widening in terms of the carriageway. Um, mm -hmm. And if you see that kind of moves its way in a diagonal direction towards the existing carriageway, which narrows down and, and gets much shorter um, next to tree fifty nine. So. Essentially, mm. the, the only works that are occurring there are within a, a small margin of the uh, the canopy, and, and nothing nothing close to the to the tree. Okay, thanks. That just that that allows all of the necessary turning to occur without having to go further down um, uh, the avenue, closer to to the water or number fifty. Does the panel have any further questions? No, well, okay. No. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Gouge, for your assistance. Thank you uh, to the panel and, and to the planners. Thank you. The final registered speaker is Marco Silva of Ethos Urban. Mr. Silva, would you like to address the panel? And thank you, Joe. I might jump in. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Silva is actually from the applicant, um, and he's he just received a text to say there's nothing that um, needs to say. He's not not from Ethos Urban, but from um, from Essex um, Essex Property, the applicant. Um, yep. So, um, so jumping. Thanks. Thank you very much. Then that concludes all the registered speakers for um, item 4.3. So we'll move on to the final item on the public uh, hearing, public meeting agenda. Item 4.4 concerning 22 Raglan Street, Manly, DA 2022 stroke 2256 for demolition works and construction of a mixed use development basic basement car parking. There is no objector registered to speak. Uh, there are four registered speakers uh, for the applicant who are uh, Matt Carlisle, Carlisle Architects, James Phillips, Heritage Consultant of Weir Phillips Heritage and Planning, Lockie Paramore, the owner applicant, and uh, Greg Boston of Boston Blythe, Blythe Fleming. So um, those speakers who are all associated can decide which order that they would like to speak in, but um, absent uh, them indicating to the contrary, I'll uh, call upon them in the order in which I read out their names. Mr. Carlisle, would you like to address the panel? Mr. Carlisle, are you there? No, apparently not. Uh, then uh, uh, Mr. Phillips, uh, would you like to address the panel? Yes, please. I, I'm here. Can you hear me? Sorry, who is speaking, please? This is James Phillips speaking. Thank Yes, Mr. Phillips, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Excellent. I, I can't see my picture on the screen, so I'll assume you can see me. Um, <clears throat> I'm speaking in terms of the heritage of this building. It's located in a conservation area, and it was uh, formerly an ambulance station. It hasn't been an ambulance station in uh, over 40 years, since 1986. 
uh, when it was a, 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 around which time it was converted to a backpackers and has, has been a backpackers ever since. Uh, a building was built beside it uh, sometime later that um, tried to imitate the uh, original building. But in doing so, the original building, which featured face brickwork, has been completely rendered and painted, considerably diminishing its um, significance in terms of the conservation area. The conservation area is interesting in that it um, it focuses mainly in its um, statement of significance on, and I've just got to get the road in front of me, um, uh, the, um, the, the, the main uh, 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 part of Pitwater Road. Um, and it, in the statement of significance, it notes a number of shops along Pitwater Road. And if you go to Pitwater Road itself, uh, there is quite a nice row of shops and some quite nice houses along there, which make the uh, principal and significant part of the conservation area. Our site's located in Raglan Street, and there's a large uh, new block of building on the corner of Raglan and Pitwater Road uh, that sort of separate and the fact that the, it turns around the corner that separate it from uh, <clears throat> those Pitwater Road shops. I think it's um, uh, valid that um, the uh, applicant um, has gone to much trouble and with much passion to uh, uh, have a building design that uh, demonstrates design excellence and that will um, contribute to the area as a new building of high quality. And uh, as such, from a heritage point of view, uh, removing the existing building, um, I don't think will constitute a loss to the um, heritage amenity of that part of Manly, particularly, as I said, the conservation area which gives it, within which it lies uh, focuses its significance on Pitwater Road and that area of Pitwater Road north of Raglan Street, which is not directly visibly connected to the subject site. Thank you. Does the panel have any questions? No. no thank you. Uh, in that case, uh, we'll move. Thank you for that, Mr Phillips. We'll move on to the next um, registered speaker for the applicant, who is uh, Lockie Parham or uh, owner applicant. Uh, Mr. Paramore, would you like to address the panel? Yes, thank you and thank you for having me. I'll um, I'll try to be as quick as I can. Uh, so yeah, as mentioned, I'm Lockie Paramore. I'm the owner and applicant for this. Uh, I, I just wanted to sort of talk about the journey a little bit, uh, which started uh, in the cold depths of COVID. Um, we own a uh, operator, backpackers on the site. Uh, the backpackers was closed indefinitely during 2020, 2021. Um, during COVID, um, and so we set about this process of of lodging a DA and, and converting what's a very old, um, uh, largely dilapidated building uh, with with many issues uh, into a mixed use, but primarily uh, residential building. Uh, spent about a year curating the design um, of a community positive building uh, with great amenity, uh, which contained in the original uh, form uh, five high physical needs uh, NDIS apartments, uh, five lower cost New York style uh, loft mezzanine apartments, and four sort of downsizer style apartments. Um, uh, we engage with council uh, a lot along the way, um, which has led um, to a few meetings with DSAP um, and council officers and have amended the plans uh, a lot along the way on, on various pieces of advice. Um, I think Matt, the architect who uh, should have spoken just before, but uh, I'm sure we'll get a chance in a moment. Um, I think he's de designed a fantastic uh, new streetscape um, that addresses uh, you know, the, the need for a high amenity, great quality building um, in the area uh, into the future. Um, I think it ties in the uh, older elements of, of the western side of the building, which was originally an ambulance station uh, very well, but ties it into a new urban environment in a very positive manner. Um, it's not going to be a cheap facade to build, um, uh, but I've always wanted to add to the manly urban environment and be, really be proud of this building uh, sort of in 50 or 100 years' time, as it, as it may be. Um, I, I note that uh, what's currently there, the backpackers, um, we have a good working relationship with the neighbours, but it's very clear to me that they're 
uh, sick to death of living next to a backpackers. So uh, I've really engaged with them along the way to try to come up with a superior outcome. Um, so, you know, greater uh, setbacks, quieter buildings, uh, far more quality um, of building, which I think is appropriate. Um, and ultimately, um, you know, where we are in the process, which is three years down the, the path and uh, numerous changes on conflicting advice, um, I would love to keep this uh, process um, out of the out of the clogged uh, court system. Um, I'm willing to do what's what's fair and sensible uh, to achieve an outcome uh, that's going to be great for the community, uh, great for the neighbours, and great for the uh, occupants. Um, and you know, I, I believe this design achieves that, or this design with some a few you know tweaks also achieves it. Um, and uh, yeah, thank everyone for their time. Thank you very much. Does the panel have any questions? No. Uh, in that case, um, is Mr. Carlisle now available? Or yeah, not? sorry about that. I am. Uh, yes, Mr. Carlisle, would you like to address the panel? Thanks, I will. Thank you. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for your time. Um, so I'm the architect on the project. Um, Lockie has mentioned that with, we, we provided a uh, uh, a well-resolved and detailed pre-lodgement design uh, consisting of a three-storey building with mezzanine uh, loft apartments to to council, which had five uh, disabled apartments to be constructed from, from the start, five low-cost lo New York loft apartments and four two-bedroom apartments. And, um, and the, the, the council uh, design and sustainability review panel were generally supportive the, the facade is the same as pretty much what you're seeing with the DA now. Um, and they were supportive of the facade. They were supportive of the full demolition, demolition of the building. Um, they, um, their comments were that they felt too many units were south facing. They wanted more north facing apartments. Um, and they recommend, and, and uh, they supported the, the nil side setback of the street to reinforce the street front. They supported a nil front setback. Um, so they and then they um and they um they supported generally the 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 scheme as a as a as a as a future desired character for for Manly in this location. Um, but they actually in in order to get more north facing apartments, they gave very specific recommendations. Uh, one of which was to add another floor level. Um, and the floor, that floor level to contain two north facing apartments and a generous communal roof terrace. They wanted, uh, they, they requested the second floor to be set back at the rear, side setback increased from three metres to 4.3 metres. And they requested the rear setback to be increased to SEP 65 requirements. It was close to that already. Um, they, um, uh, they also supported the full demolition of the facade, and they made the comments that that on this site they were not concerned with the floor space ratio controls, the height controls, the setback controls, as the existing backpackers building is is so uh, over all those controls already. Um, and they just really just said that as long as not any non-compliance with the controls was justified in terms of the amenity of the apartment. The streetscape and the neighbours. So we uh, we took on board all their recommendations, um, and so I'll note that council's planning officers in the pre-DA lodgement notes said uh, that they they uh, agree with all of the D the DSAP recommendations, and um, and that included the fourth level. Um, they 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 wrote to say, in that they said uh, council generally supports each of the recommendations by DSAP, subject to the applicant providing. In, uh, justification for any variations to the building height and FSR. So we made those amendments. We added the fourth floor with the two apartments facing north, the communal roof terrace. We increased the rear setback at the uh, at the rear to six metres in compliance with the apartment design guide. We increased the second floor side setbacks to 4.3 metres as recommended by DSAP. Um, we amended the apartment mix. Uh, they, they asked us to delete the loft apartments, the low cost ones, and 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 put some larger apartments, but fewer apartments in. Uh, we were a bit surprised by this, but we did it, and um, and we uh, we reduced the number of apartments from 14 down to 10. There were some 
um, discussion about the rear landscaping and we increased the landscaping to have the minimum three metre uh, and seven percent of the site area dimensions as required by SEP 65 and uh, and we submitted the the DA to council and and, and then got uh, a, a letter from council saying that DSAP don't support or well, that that DSAP were generally well. Most of the most of the recommendations had been accommodated and, and included, but but the DSAP didn't support uh, didn't fully support the setbacks and the height. And council didn't really fully support the setbacks and the height. But I make the point that that the setbacks and the height and the and the bulk of the building, the volume of the building has come about through the recommendations of DSAP. They they like the front nil setback at the front. They like the the, the street to street at the front. And they wanted a, a fourth level. They recommended the side setback specifically, which we provided. They recommended the ADG compliant rear setback of six meters, which we provided. And that and that provide and that produced a, a very clear definition of the, the volume of the building, which is Carlisle. Mr. Carlisle, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we have read your submission that you sent us yesterday, which I think you're pretty much reiterating now, are you not? Oh, okay, sure. Um well I'll, I'll just make the final point that that the um, the the um, council's uh, assessing officer's comments uh, in the first few pages uh, on that states that that council has um, assessed the development application against the step 65 and council's privacy um, controls and find that the privacy issues are acceptable and the council has um, also assessed overshadowing controls of step 65 and council and finds the overshadowing uh, acceptable and, and no no over, no overshadow of neighbours and that the streetscape is acceptable. So so in terms of justifying the non-compliance of FSR and height, the main issues um, of any non-compliance of FSR and height and bulk are problems with overshadowing neighbours, uh, overlooking neighbours or poor streetscape. And council have stated in their assessment that they have no problem with the overshadowing of neighbours. They have no problem with the overlooking of neighbours, and they have no problem with the streetscape. So I'm just, we're just very confused as to why we've done everything council have asked. They state that they don't have any problems with overshadowing, overlooking, and streetscape. They support the DSAP supports the heritage demolition, demolition sorry, of the of the facade in the heritage conservation area, and yet they recommending for refusal. We're just extremely surprised and confused, and uh, you know would request that the panel review um, what I've said and, and, and what council and DSAP have, have recommended to us. And, and also we believe that the, the design is an excellent design and doesn't overshadow, doesn't overlook and is beneficial in the streetscape and provides a good mix of residential accommodation badly needed in central Manly. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, you. Does the panel have any questions? Uh, just just a heard. quick Oh, you go. Uh, the, the, one of the main concerns is that extra fourth level, with its compliance with the controls. That that that's not characteristic of that area, and that sets a precedent for other redevelopments, which is contrary to the current controls, isn't it? Well, it is. But but both the council's design review panel assessments, the design and sustainability review panel recommended we we add it, which we did. And they recommended that it be set back four metres from the streetscape, so it's not, not not visible, overly visible from the streetscape, which we did. Um, and um, and 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 they agree with us that 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 density in, in a central manly location, 400 metres to the ferry, and getting getting as many you know housing in, in suitable locations near to public transport is desirable if it doesn't. If it doesn't detrimentally affect our neighbours and streetscape, which they say it doesn't, so to to me it seems a good location to to subtly increase a little bit of density in a central location near near public transport without affecting others. Matt, I mean, just follow up on that. I mean, one of the design review panel, uh, what what they said, as I understand, was that had to be justified against a number of criteria, including impact on the public domain. All of your photo montages are quite close to the side. If you're coming up Belgrave Street, you that top floor would be very visible, wouldn't it? Uh, coming up Belgrave. Um, oh, 
Well, the, the, it, because it's not right on the corner, down, when you go down Belgrave, you, I guess as you're approaching near Manly Oval, you'd see it looking up, but further back Belgrave, you wouldn't see it because the buildings on Pitwater Road on the east side would, would hide it, including... But, I think but the but further away you get, and you can see it for quite a distance down Belgrave, it, that top floor becomes very visible. And I, I'm just following up what um, Bob said. I mean, it will stick up above the net, the adjoining two buildings. So, and again, the whole of the floor is above the height standard. Mm. I, I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, I think obviously state government's looking for higher density and, and that's someone's going to be first. You know, that's what happens. I mean, you know, that they're, they're, they're needing higher density in central areas. They're bringing it out this week. You know, it'll be... But the, I mean, the appropriate way of dealing with that, if you thought the density of that strip needed to be changed, would be a planning proposal, not a clause 4.6. Well, suggest. except that in this instance, the Design and Review, Sustainability Review Panel recommended it, in fact, and then and council endorsed it and said and said we uh, we we agree with um, DSAP's recommendations and and we've gone ahead and just done what DSAP have recommended and council have recommended. So. They didn't ask for a planning proposal. They asked for another floor. I'm not suggesting. I'm simply saying that if yeah. you think the controls are wrong, that's the answer. A planning proposal. If you if you're relying on the existing controls, you have to justify them against the objectives of the, of the control. And uh, one of those, including bulk, if you're seeing it from up from a from not from closer quarters or less so from closer quarters, but for certainly coming up. Mm -hmm from other public streets surrounding the site, and it's popping up well above the adjoining yeah, buildings. That, that's, a, that's a bit of a bulk problem, isn't it? Uh, I think I agree with you. I think I think um, the, the the commercial building on the corner of Pitwater Road and Raglan Street is is uh, not the prettiest building and it's underdeveloped. It's only two levels where it, its height control is also, uh, it's actually higher, I think it's 12 metres. Um, and I look. I, I I I would expect in time that building on the corner will be developed. And corner sites are often, you know, often taller than other sites because they they become a, a sort of a feature on the corner. So I could imagine, as I said, I could imagine other other buildings potentially getting bigger in in the central Manly area. So sort of somebody somebody ends up being first. There's obviously buildings on a little bit further away that are much taller than this one down on the beachfront. Um, We looked at we have looked at options where there's there's mezzanine mezzanine in roof spaces which um which uh you know which are, which is an option that we looked at and we well we provided for the pre DA but but the DSAP recommended a whole other level so we we're, we're just not you know we we assume that council have have a vision for higher density and and higher buildings in this area I know there's a new LEP coming shortly but I don't know the I don't know the uh, the contents but I did read. Um, that height limits were being increased, particularly because SEP 65 requires higher floor to floors than previously envisaged, and SEP 65 require, well, often allows feature feature roofs over the height limit. So I'm not sure whether there's a a future desired area for Manly uh, to be taller in that particular area, but perhaps that's what council was envisaging when they when they recommended the extra level. Are there any uh, further questions? I just have no. one, Mr. Carlisle. Um, in the DSAP report, and I'm looking at page 286 of the agenda papers, about almost halfway down the page, the, the DSAP appeared to consider that the excessive floor area was due to what they called extravagant room sizes and an excessive provision of bathrooms. Yeah. Do you give any response to that? Uh, I'm a bit. I was a bit confused. I'd, I've designed a lot of apartments with two or three bathrooms. I think. I think in Manly, Central Manly, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of down. Uh, there's a lot. Of, well, there's a lot of families who can no longer obviously afford housing, and they're looking for they're looking for house, well, not house size apartments, but um, there's a SEP 65 also really. Is, and the state government's really pushing for for proper family-sized apartments as they were built in the 1970s with with bigger rooms and spaces for teenagers and ex larger bathrooms and uh, you know not just a 
not just sort of crammed in three bedroom apartments just to get a, a yield and, and get a developer a higher rate. They're actually trying to make them big enough that actually families can live in. So I was a bit confused when that one of the comments uh, the DSAP said was that that the that the apartments didn't provide good enough amenities. So then when we made them bigger and gave them bigger bathrooms, they said the bathrooms are too many and the, the rooms are too large. So I, I, yeah, I find that a bit confusing and contradictory. Thank you. Does the panel have any further questions? No. No, well, thank you for your assistance, uh, Mr. Carlisle. That uh, okay. leaves the final uh, registered speaker for the applicant, uh, Mr. Boston. Mr. Boston, would you like to address the panel? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> look, a little, an unusual site, I'd say, that it's actually zoned R3, medium density residential, whereby the two properties either side um, the one to the uh, to the west is zoned um, E1 local centre, and the one on the corner, which has been redeveloped, is in in the same residential zone, uh, but was approved um, through the court process. So, the fundamental position from DSAP, and it's supported by council, is that contextually this site reads as part of the local centre, um, rather than reading part of the the sort of the medium density. R3 zone spine that runs through to the north and to that extent um, the building could be constructed boundary to boundary in relation to the side boundaries just to maintain a consistent um, street wall. So the mixed use component comes from the fact that neighbourhood shops are permissible in the R3 zone. Um, there is an appeal um, being filed um, that is on the basis that the application was lodged in January this year and if we didn't file the appeal um, in July, um, August, we would have lost the deemed refusal appeal right. Um, so the appeal was on foot not because we didn't want to deal with council and try and get a, a, an agreed solution, um, but because um, simply we were going to lose a, a right that we, we uh, otherwise would have been um, we would be entitled to. Um, there has been some conflicting um, advice provided by DSAP and in, in, in good faith we did provide the um, amended plans with the additional upper, upper level. I guess the reason we wanted to present to you today is on the basis that um, you've heard from James Phillips from Weir Phillips in relation to the um, you know the council's position in, re in relation to the uh, existing facade and um, we would ask the panel to endorse um, the position of DSAP and of James Phillips in relation to um, enabling the demolition of the existing buildings on site and the replacement of, uh, of the building facade as currently proposed. Now, it, it was endorsed and praised by DSAP. Uh, it incorporates um, the same sort of arched elements that um, appeared in the original uh, ambulance station building, um, and to that extent, uh, we believe that that's a far superior outcome. I hear um, the concern in relation to the building height and the additional floor space that that upper level um, creates. And I guess it would be open to the panel and um, would not be objected um, by the proponent on the basis that you were prepared to support the facade as currently proposed, if by way of condition the upper level were deleted. Um, that would um, resolve, I think, the height and the FSR concerns, um, but would provide us with some certainty in relation to the, um, the front building facade. And to that extent, on balance, I believe that that would be a fair and reasonable outcome. Um, uh, so, you know, the submission today is that um, provided the front facade is something that the panel would be prepared to support. Um, that uh, if the panel were concerned about height and FSR, and I hear Ms Laidlaw and uh, Mr Hussey's concern in relation to the height and floor space, that um, such a condition would not be opposed and that uh, on the basis of that, the, the current proceedings would be discontinued. Um, apart from that, happy to answer any questions that might arise. Yes, one question. Often when you make a change, you create two other problems. Simply putting a condition on to delete the top level, is that likely to create a lot of other problems? Because you have, if you're getting a consent, that would relate to the, the number of plans that is before the panel. 
and oh. they probably need extensive or a fair bit of modification. Oh, look, it, um, look, that's not an unusual proposition that there's a condition imposed that requires amendments, either by way of a deferred commencement condition, whereby the amended plans come back to the consent authority to sign off on, uh, or alternatively, it's just something that's dealt with at CC. If, if the upper level were deleted, then yes, there's apartments deleted and the communal open space. Um, the the issue of communal open space was dealt with in the proceedings on the, the property to the east. Uh, Commissioner Senior Commissioner Moore presiding at that stage where he didn't raise any concern in relation to communal open space or the absence of it on the basis that the site's within you know, 80 or 100 metres of, of Manly Beach and a plethora of open spaces, including the, uh, the oval and tennis courts across the road. So, Again, um, there, there would be no knock-on impacts on the levels below, and the uh, currently the floor slab, if you like, would become the you know the upper you know roof slab of the of the development. But a deferred commencement condition may well be the appropriate way to proceed. So Mr. Boston, um, I, I noted that your comment earlier that. The uh, Dean refusal appeal was lodged, did not indicate that you didn't want to deal with council. Your remarks you've just made are consistent with that. Uh, but rather than talk in terms of deferred commencement conditions and, and, uh, and, and so on, I'm trying to work out what the implications of removing the top floor are concerned. Are concerned. And also, whether in relation to whether there's any scope, if you like, for any compromise in relation to that facade, uh, w would it not be better if the panel was so minded to say, well, look, what's before us at the moment? And I, I'm not preempting anything, I'm just opposing the hypothesis. Would it not be preferable from your point of view, from your client's point of view, or what's before us at the moment to be refused? And you then to continue your negotiations with the council and take advantage of the review provision by this panel, not as presently constituted, but by the same panel, which is quite an expeditious procedure that would give you the opportunity to work out really what precisely has to be done rather than this panel trying to work it out on the run. Sure. No, look, um a good point, uh, Mr. Chair. The, the the issue with that is the fact that the application is integrated development, and we don't get uh, the uh, ability to engage with the 8.2 review mechanism under the Act for for integrated development. But um, you know, if the panel was of a mind to refuse the application today, then we're already in the Section 34 conciliation. Uh, process within the the uh, uh, the court jurisdiction, and uh, those negotiations you know could potentially you know continue. Um, we were hoping to um, to circumvent that and and save everyone some time and and uh, and certainly cost and uh, at least get an approval today for um, a vast majority of what is proposed on merit. And uh, you know, on the basis that if the panel wasn't happy with height and FSR, that we would be prepared to accept the condition. I may have just missed something there. You, did you uh, say Greg, isn't, yeah, isn't there a problem that you don't have the general terms of approval from Water New South Wales? Oh, look, the G, in relation, yes, it's a an issue. Um, we didn't lodge the application as integrated development council has referred it off their own bat, and it's up to the applicant to nominate it as integrated or not. That said, um, Council didn't refer it. It was seven months after we lodged the application that the integrated referral occurred to Water. Um, and my understanding is Water now has everything that they need to, to issue the GTAs. And again, um, if the panel was of a mind otherwise to support it subject to conditions, um, then the panel you know, could potentially ask staff to follow them up today and ask for a copy of those GTAs. They've certainly had you know, the referral and the information that they've requested for uh, sufficient time. Can I say something on that for a minute? The, 
my understanding is that the water referral regarded was regarding uh, any potential dewatering required during construction if the if the building uh, was below the water table. But um, my experience in Manly, and I, I designed the building next door and quite a few on the beachfront, is that we would be well above the water table. So I, I would not expect there to be any issue with dewatering anyway. So I, I don't believe that the the, uh, the the that the water application has any any particular problems. Yes. Okay. Um, well, does the panel have any other questions? No. Well, thank you, thank you, Mr. Boston, and uh, the other speakers for your assistance. Thank you very much. Cheers. Uh, so that uh, then concludes the public meeting. As I indicated earlier, the panel will uh, shortly go into closed session to consider all the matters on the public um, hearing, public meeting agenda, and also the, the matters that are not on the public meeting agenda that I identified at the start of the day. So um, I will now uh, close this meeting and the panel will resume in about half an hour at 2.30, closed session, to consider those matters. This public meeting is now closed.